for, for those that don't know, I'm Chris Donato and, and look, I use workshops pretty extensively in my selling process and, 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 and when I, you know, delivering services and what prompted this of course was, you know, trying to, I'm, I've been struggling to figure out how to get the same results as we've, you know, COVID has moved us online and, you know, you know, adding to the complexity is you'll probably hear kids running around my house in a minute, a dog will bark, you know, so it's all that stuff we're experiencing. And I knew I wasn't alone. I've reached out to some of you who are already, you know, who are experiencing the same thing. And we have customers uh, that are, that are also taking their, you know, their on their offline in-person experiences and trying to figure out how do we do this? So, you know, in the face of this situation, I turn to, you know, the, what I believe is the world's expert at running these immersive workshops. Um, and I, I wanted to ask him how he has adapted his organization to this, this new paradigm. Uh, many of you know John um, and have probably participated in one of his sessions. He's the founder and CEO of Group Partners, a, a London-based uh, management consulting company. And Group Partners takes workshops to an entirely new level. If you haven't experienced one, uh, you'll get a glimpse of it uh, today uh, in throughout this discussion. So, John, thank you, and you know, for accepting the invitation to share your insights with us today. You know, a good workshop is 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 a lot of prep uh, and and um, and pre work, and you've already been experiencing some of that. You've registered, you answered some questions, you've you've been introduced to some technology. I mean, you know, doing strong strong prep, you know, produces a good experience and. Um, there is a lot of work behind the scenes to do this, as many of you know, who put these, put these things together. We recommend that you have a producer to, to produce your workshops. And in our case, um, we have Stacy Olson, who's produced us and gotten us all together in good fashion. So Stacy, uh, I'll turn to you before I set the end in mind. Are there rules of engagement or anything you want to share with the team? Just, um, you guys are all familiar with Zoom, so you know how to mute yourself, unmute yourself. We love seeing the cameras on, so that's great if you wanna have it on. Um, I think the only thing is we just really want this to be interactive and this will kind of give us a, a glimpse into a, a lot of the questions that you guys answered talked about engagement. And so we really do want it to be interactive. So if you're not comfortable unmuting yourself, you can use the little raised hand um, reaction, or you can type in the chat. I'll be monitoring what's in the chat. So if you have a question as we go, rather than save everything until the end, it's best to kind of answer real time. So feel free to, to either of either of those options, chat or um, just unmute yourself. I'll be monitoring that. We are recording this. So if you don't want to be famous, I guess on Chris's LinkedIn, <laughs> you can take your name down now. Um, but no, I just, I'm um, sure. looking forward to a good call. Oh, we, we, John has been experiencing some zoom issues, which he'll talk about. So if there is a brief interlude, Chris has got some stand up comedy, um, skits that he's prepared to perform. So just so you guys know, bear with us. We are going to keep <laughs> plowing through. Go eat on. So look, the end in mind is that we're, you know, that, that, that each of us are able to create uh, the immersive workshops that we're accustomed to and bring those uh, into this digital paradigm. I think the, the most obvious thing is what I alluded to before was the in, the, in the real world, it was about, for me, it was about whiteboards, flip charts, try and keep away from PowerPoint, by keeping it interactive that kind of way. Yeah. And you end up sort of sitting here and waving my hands an awful lot. Where there's like one group that's really participating and then there's another group that's just kind of finds solace and sitting back and hanging out. Um, that right. everybody is, you know, all together and bouncing off each other and the energy and that you don't mm. start to see separation of energy. Perfect. Makes sense. Are we going to cover such a thing as like optimal workshop size online? Is it in terms of its difference to in the real world? I'm still yeah. learning how to come off mute here. I, for me, I think um, the, the thing that I had written down after I submitted it was, you, you know, we, see, we tend to think that we need to have a shorter time when the meetings are online, where I think that's what we've been saying anyway, is okay. people can only handle so much. So what you used to do in a full day, you need to shrink down to two hours or whatever. So first of all, is that true? Second of all, is there a cool, a better way to think about that? And third of all, when you shrink that down, 
how do you quickly get people engaged? So, you know, you kind of are able to warm up people when you're working with them face to face, but in this scenario, how do you, in the first five minutes, really get them engaged is what I'd be interested in too. Hey, hello, obviously good to be here. And I just want to cover the Zoom thing. I mean, part of the technology challenge is just what do you do? I mean, we're expecting, I've been on three Zoom calls today, each of which was interrupted by technology fails <clears throat> and server connections. And something you might want to download and use is a, a, an app called Down Detector. It's a free app. You can, whatever technology you're using, I mean, we're not here, we're not sponsored by Zoom, we're on Microsoft Teams, we're on all sorts of uh, different video conferencing technologies, but they're all available to view for their up or downness on that little app. And you can see that Zoom right now, literally an hour ago, inside is the having- cupboard. Inside the cupboard, where the, where the um, thing is. Hello? And then learning how to mute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. There you go. That's a good one. Um, so no matter how hard you try, there's always going to be something that will interfere with what it is you're trying to do. And this is a good way to get ahead of the curve and see what's going on before it, before it happens. I thought that was worth sharing with you guys. I want to start the formal part of this discussion, though, with the fact that preparation is tough, even with the best will in the world and working with the kinds of clients that we're working with, their intention is high, but the reality is very mixed. So the idea of even the idea that it's called a workshop is worth unpacking a little bit. I think what we're talking about here is not that the workshop has a particular end in mind. It's just a device we're using to get people together to have a conversation. So what I learned really early on, having been doing workshops in the real world, world for the last three decades is that nobody really wants to be in them. But if they're part of a, a process of getting to an outcome, then it can, be, it can make all the difference. And the fact that we then might call that a session or a conversation online, but anything that gets it away from the idea of a workshop is, is an interesting one to discuss. So as you get into uh, the discussions with your team and start to create the audience, which we're going to get into in a minute, those become quite interesting yet subtle things to get to get right. What I'm going to show you today has been born, as I say, out of a long time of working with these kinds of clients. Not always massive and large like these, but primarily, frankly. And what caused it was the fact that the teams had no method, no objective and um, humane way of having conversations in a safe place with some kind of structure attached to it. And so what occurred to me was that if I could almost by stealth create a, a way of holding conversations that was non-threatening, was interactive and, and visual, which is what I'm going to come on to, but also highly relevant and resonant to the challenges that everybody has, i.e. making it completely germane to the topic, then I could make things happen much better. And the way that I did that was to um, really spend a lot of time on the reason why people want to be in the conversation in the first place. And you'll hear me talk through this about something I called the exam question, which was, my way of getting everyone to spend more time on the reason why we want to be in any kind of workshop before we even got in there. And you'll see that come to life through here as well. So I would go to meetings and I'd be listening to people talking and having real world conversations and I, it just drove me nuts. And the insight was that I would get on the whiteboard or the flip chart and I would start to draw out the conversation right there in front of them. And I noticed a couple of things. One was that they would fall silent watching me draw on the wall. And also they would say, actually, that's not what I meant, but it is what I said. So by the act of me writing on a wall, like lots of people do in a facilitation <laughs> context and literally verbatim write on that wall, mm, interesting. The, re the response was, oh my God, that's really not what I meant. 
So I stopped doing that. I stopped writing verbatim on the wall and I listened to what more the people were actually trying to say and developed this routine of being able to kind of synthesize what a group of people were saying and put that on the wall. And that slowly started to raise the altitude of the, of the conversation anyway. And gradually I learned better and better questions. And this, this what I'm gonna show you now is a kind of summary of that idea. And I've had to slow the video down so you can see what I'm doing here. I'm normally much quicker than this drawing on the wall. But just <laughs> summarize what's going on here was by getting deeper and deeper into the question that was being asked and trying to anticipate what an awful lot of the conversations were, get, were likely to be, I could start to create a framework visually that would be able to host the kind of conversation we would then want to have. And this is kind of the context going up on the wall now of the stuff that through preparation, any facilitator or any workshop should automatically know. And then when the people came in, two things would happen. One, they would realize that their previous efforts had been honored and that the conversation was much more efficient for them to literally drop into. So this was a more efficient way of hosting a workshop because the context was already arranged for them and the conversation that they needed to have was now much more focused on the conversation they needed to have. Listen, John, Nicole and Andrew both posted comments. Nicole said, listening is such an important lesson online and in real life. We're always anticipating what we're going to say next. And Andrew said, and active listening is a tough skill and it really is. And I think we, you and I, or the three of us had talked about this before we got started. A big part of conducting an online meeting and having it go smoothly, you learn some of those skills by being a participant first. So when you're on one of these online workshops, you as a facilitator know how difficult it is to really listen to what folks are saying and for everyone else to be listening as well. So it really kind of starts with, change starts with me, which is one of my big mottos for the, <laughs> for the upcoming year. But it really does start with like, paying attention, listening, not trying to multitask just because, you know, people can't see that your phone is down here. Or they can't hear what the conversation going on over here. Um, it really starts with everyone playing an active role in making a workshop go well. At the beginning of this call, we heard that there is, you know, what is the right length of time for a conversation online? The answer to that is there isn't one provided everybody's really got some skin in the game and are genuinely interested in the exam question. So I spend a lot of time with clients in advance getting the exam question right. What is it that's most likely to get people's attention? And let's phrase that as an exam question. And the exam question is, you know, what is our future vision that's gonna give us material growth over the next three, six, 12, nine months? You know, whatever the question is, it doesn't matter. How do we launch this product? How do we change our culture? How do we do anything, frankly? Get over the jargon, not wrap this in too much jargon and structure and methodology up front. No one's got the time for that anymore. So let's say, look, this is a series of conversations that we wanna have with you because you give a damn about this question. So that's the second point on there. Create a series of inter interconnected conversations that can happen over a course of time. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. And then ask quote questions that really focus on what matters. And you'll see how, to Chris's point, how we get prepped for that. Be as visual as you can. And it's, as, it's easier than you think. I'm going to show you how to do that, even though I've shown you me drawing on a wall, which is not going to happen online anytime soon. I can show you how you can kind of repeat that experience. Um, and it is easier than you think. Um, also getting comfortable with silence. This is a, this is a kind of tr classic trap where just because no one's saying anything, someone feels they have to pile in. It drives me nuts because it proves they weren't really listening or they're not really thinking or one or the other, not always, but quite often, particularly on the facilitation side. And because that's when people are thinking, um, and really be conscious on the semantics. I mean, a few of us who have on this call have been together in sessions where we've, we've asked a word, what is your definition of this? Let's take quality. And for, I can tell you for 15 people in the room, everyone's definition of quality is gonna be different. I can guarantee that's true of vision, innovation, 
strategy, culture, in fact, of every single word. And when you're dealing with complex transformation, you can imagine people coming to a workshop and literally walking away with a set of simple words that have not been drilled into their definition and they're all gonna go away and build something completely different. And we've experienced the results of that, haven't we? Um, and as I say, make sure we're asking the right damn question. I've boiled that down and I will share all this stuff with you. I boiled that down to a kind of art, which literally, as it says on there, preparation, configuration, collaboration, execution. You know, that's not meant to be anything complicated. It's get prepared, configure the conversation that you want to have as a series of interconnected, interconnected conversations, figure out how best to collaborate with everybody and get to execution and action as a result of those interventions as quickly as you possibly can. Now, obviously for me as group partners, we've built online tools and methodologies and structures and systems around that, but we don't expose that to clients unless we absolutely have to. We just let that come into the conversation as and when it needs to be. And again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on. Because right now, all we've got is this little window. Here we all are. This is from a live session. We've all been there. It's not, it's not to everyone's taste. Most of us are not particularly comfortable discussing stuff with lots of people. And that's the majority of people are not that comfortable with it. So what we've got to try and do is get to the right audience really quickly, because we can do an awful lot through that little window. This is an example of a client, a very recent client, where we've done exactly everything I've said to you right now, intense prep, check-ins on the technology, show them how to use the virtual whiteboards that we're using, and there are many of them, get really clear on the exam question, and then break the conversations down into little chunks and host those as regularly and as often as we need to. And John, could you, could you unpack intense prep? I gave folks uh, an idea of, hey, if you don't have a lot of time, clients are tough to get a hold of, just you know, a, a quick conversation, just maybe a flavor for what is intense prep? Yeah, it, it's a great question. It comes back to the exam question. I mean, these kinds of exam questions are, as I say, mostly sort of large enterprise transformation and scale challenges, growth challenges. This is an organization looking to um, increase its market share and grow by X percent over the next three to five years. And what does our technology infrastructure and stack need to look like in order to do that? Yeah. A very familiar territory for a lot of people on this call. Um, and that took, I'm going to say, four weeks of plowing through all of the documentation that the team had already built, which was tons of it hosting conversations with them, just chat conversations on whatever means necessary on Zooms, by email, by WhatsApp. Okay. Um, literally going through that process I just went through of preparing, not only challenging them what the exam question was, what is the real question we're going to spend two half day sessions on? And who are the right people to be in the room when we have that conversation? Got it. We go to a lot of, it, of trouble. We could probably compress four weeks down to two but interestingly, with these kinds of organizations, getting the right people in the room is not that easy. You know, they're traveling or they're, they're too busy or they're too senior or they don't know. And it's not easy. It's a real ballet. It's a real choreography that needs to happen. So there's no real, you know, heuristic, simple answer to that. It's what's the exam question and what do we want the outcome of that session to be? And I'll, I'll come back to that again as we go through this. I just want to give you some of the top line insights. I've done that one to death. I think we can spend two weeks just getting the exam question right. And that's because when we challenge the client, the senior client, he says, look, I just want to have a session where I get all my top team together and make sure they're all on the same page. That's not a good exam question for me. A good exam question for me is, how are we going to increase our market share by X percent over the next three, six, 12 months? Or how do we need to think as a team in order to align with the massive amount of change that we're getting thrown at us by our competitors? I can work with that. 
because in those sentences, we can start to determine what the frameworks need to be, that, i.e. the conversations that we need to have, that we can break down into those little chunks to be able to answer a question like that. I'm, I'm sure everybody on this call has gone into a workshop where it's not clear what the requirement is, and you spend ages having conversations over the top of each other, and it meanders off into all sorts of areas. I mean, this is the antithesis of this. That's the devil right there. So if you get everyone to be clear and present and you get their attention on a question that is of interest to everybody, then they'll turn up and magic can happen. Second of all, do short sprints, work your way in. Again, these tend to be because I'm working on larger exam questions and larger challenges than perhaps many people are who just want to hold a workshop. But the same is true. Even if it's, look, let's just get our team together and chat about this. That's fine, but make sure you've defined this. Because when you start to define this, you'll realize there are many dimensions to it. And it becomes a bit of an art after a while, and it makes it much more enjoyable to get on a call and have a, a discussion. This is the first time I've ever done a webinar on this. So I've never done this conversation before. But it was important to me to make sure that I want to do workshops that work. And so my exam question to me was, what makes workshops work? That's these things, these little insights I'm giving you now. Make damn sure you know what you're doing. Do it in short sprints. Make sure that you have the right number of people on it. And that can be, you know, any number of people, frankly, but between 10 and 20 is good. And that's not because you couldn't get more on the call and make them interested because you cannot get their attention to even prepare or get their head around the exam question or turn up in the right way with the technology. So we just give up. We just say, okay, we're just gonna get enough of the right people in that room, break it down into these sessions and, and do it that way around. So 10 to 20 is one answer to that question. 90 to 120 minutes is another answer to that question. But if the exam question is much larger than that, then you're gonna to need to do this multiple times and don't not manage that expectation. The other trick was, as I say, as I said earlier, don't make it all about workshops, make it about conversations. Make it about a safe space that your peers are gonna show up and that it's not a public inquisition. There's no shaming, there's no blame gonna go on here. It's a series of interlinked interlink discussions where anything can happen and that's good. Good ideas, bad ideas. There's no such thing as bad questions, only bad answers. And there's no such thing as bad answers. They're probably bad questions. It's you go around that loop a few times and you end up just, let's just have a conversation guys. Let's make it safe. Let's get a good facilitator in who doesn't have too many opinions that we have to fight against this kind of stuff. John, on two questions, sorry. Um, one is around the, the conversations you talk about. It's a series of understanding that exam question will drive a series of conversations. Do you define those ahead of time and do you share them with the customer? The, the, or the you know the participants about what conversations they're walking into um yes okay yes absolutely having the sort of senior client um the sponsor if you will is essential because they have to manage expectation they have to get their troops lined up they need to know what's coming and again i'm going to come to this i'm going to tr i'm trying to get to that bit fairly quickly so that you can see how we interlink these conversations together around a given exam question um, but yeah, definitely, you have to manage expectation that way around. And at least the senior guy needs to know what's coming. This is probably the biggest one. Even when asked nicely, people will always have a, a real excuse as to why they will not get prepared. And there is a paucity of attention generally on the planet right now. I don't know really genuinely the neuroscience behind it, but it drives me nuts. I get asked to send someone a one pager about something, which is hard enough. We've all been there. How do you, you know, get something really important down onto one page and you do that and you make it into half a page and they still won't read it. Even when they're paying 30, 40, 50 grand for a, for a, for an assignment, a project, an intervention, an initial startup, you know, whatever it happens to be, whether it's 5,000 bucks or 10,000, it doesn't matter what the price is, they still won't engage. Quite staggering that people are just not seemingly interested enough to spend the time on it. 
And then when they say, yeah, they've read it, you realize they haven't because you're having to answer questions that they should have known had they read it. So we just, we spend as much time as the client will let us spend just having the conversation with them about how important it is. So number five. Chris, sorry. It, yeah. it, those things that you described, yeah. um, they feel like, and be interested in your experience, they feel like they probably also existed back in the real world. They did. People, people quite, not, right. You're quite right. They do. We, all, we all ran workshops when you know half the people didn't bother reading anything. Yep. Turned up late. we you know bloody bloody blah, blah, blah. So I'm guessing it's not any different in the online world. And it was always a challenge in the real world as to how to deal with it. I mean. The sort of the, the semi school teacher in me almost like wants to exclude those people from the meeting, but that's, that doesn't tend to be, doesn't tend to work. <laughs> that's what we'll do. And again, yeah, you're absolutely right. We've got some tools and techniques which I'm going to come to in a minute to overcome that. But you're absolutely right. Um, technology we covered in the prelim, and, and that's a big one. We tried doing sessions with all sorts of gadgets and techniques along the side. So we, everyone's pretty comfortable with Zoom or Teams or whatever. We've tried Slido, which is a kind of audience voting system and chat thing, but you end up with the technology fails. You'll, you'll have more technology fails the more you add more technology to it. And the other thing we've noticed is that being on camera isn't for everyone. There's this kind of expectation that if you're, your face isn't present in that little window, then you're not present. We've proved that to be the opposite. If people can sit quietly and still in their pajamas, as long as they're in a as long as they're paying attention, it's okay. So we're quite comfortable now with people not being on camera. A lot of people are not, it does something to their, you know, mental model or their mindset. They just don't like it. So I wouldn't insist on it, but I would insist that they're present. And this brings us back, Andrew, to your point just now. We'll come back to that in a second. How do we make sure they're present? So we're, we're much keener on the chats and the interactive techniques, which I'm going to show you in a short while, which we do know actually works. I'm, I'm conscious of going slightly quickly. So if anyone wants to jump in, Stacey, I'm sure you're keeping the chat honest and you'll just jump in and interrupt me, which I'm happy with. Um, another technology that you might want to, to bear in mind is that little Otter logo. Um, I won't ask if everyone's heard of Otter, but I'll just explain it real quick. It's actually transcribing the conversation we're having right now. It's running in the background and we can allocate names of everybody on this call to whoever speaks and through machine learning, it will learn your voice and automatically transcribe the conversation as a readout. And we will share it with everybody after this call as another record of this call. Why also we spent a lot of time in preparation was the Stacy and Chris and Nicole, who's also on this call, is also briefed to kind of contribute early because this is not a workshop, this is a webinar. We're trying to give you some of the kind of experiences that you would get in what we know works. One of the things we've learned is to establish a front runner or a couple of front runners on the team who are prepared to ask questions and join in and genuinely start the conversation starters. I mean, I'm doing a bit of a monologue right now, but if I was asking questions, there'd be people seated in the audience deliberately to ask some questions because it, it breaks the ice. It gets people to add some confidence to the rest of their teams. If they see someone else who they trust and respect talking and asking questions, they feel more comfortable to do it. It, it's to your point about being comfortable with silence as well, John, you have to create bigger pauses, I find, yeah, uh, give people time to think and then chime in. When we're in person, we can see someone's body language and, and them leaning in or making a gesture and we know they want to participate. But here, you've got to create you know, longer spaces, right? Totally. Absolutely. And this is the getting comfortable with science. I mean, if I just said, you know, what do you all think so far? This is normally where we would start. We wouldn't have done any of that for preliminary um, stuff. We would have been almost immediately in here. And just a few 
little tips before we start. If you click on the little arrow just here, you can see my cursor. It changes from an ha a hand to an arrow. Yep. And there are little, very simple little things happening here on this side, which I'll explain in a second. And there is a magnifying and plus and minus down here. And you can, if you get sporty with that, you can soon find some quick shortcuts to be able to use this. And it's an infinite whiteboard. There are no edges to this whiteboard. So this is the ultimate luxury for those of us who like whiteboards. With a little plugin, if you look down the bottom here, it's possible for me with a plugin to literally hand draw on that whiteboard like this. And this is a little movie that I prepared because we don't really have a lot of time. So I can literally draw what I used to draw on the wall. I can now draw into that whiteboard literally as we, as we saw it. But let's just say that's the framing for the conversation. Yeah. And now what I want everybody to do is go to a post-it note, which is this little puppy here. Don't get rid of mine. I'm not getting rid of yours. Okay. So, and the team would be putting their answers in. So there'd be a conversation going on in here. For, we might say, well, our engagement right now is being done on the mobile phone. So, you know, let's just imagine this says um, through a smartphone app. That smartphone app with this particular exam question or this particular part of the conversation. And I want to be able to honor the fact that that's where it is. So I'm connecting it with that. I'm connecting it with this conversation. I'm connecting it with that. Yeah. But what I wanted to try and get to was this idea that, you know, we can start to connect things together because we've prepared it. The chances are we know, roughly speaking, where the conversation is going to go. Mm -hmm. And we can start to set it up for, you know, the kinds of conversations that we know we want to have. And by using pre-built icons, I mean, I have the luxury of having a studio to be able to build, you know, I've probably got about a million, a million of these little icons that I can bring in, bearing in mind what kind of conversation that we're trying to have. And in the spirit of showing you kind of what the end might look like, you know, these are the things that we can build as a result of those conversations. And it doesn't require any drawing skill. It just requires a high degree of prep and perhaps access to a, a, an asset, a visual, a visual asset library. But even, even then, and again, I'm very conscious of time because we wanted to leave time for some Q and A's and questions. What I was trying to get at was by knowing the exam question, we can pre-configure a series of connected conversations so if we get to the big exam question, um, which in this case is the vision for smart shipping. So changing the way ships use energy across um, trade routes. So what is the vision? And we'd have a conversation about vision. What makes this so critical? You know, what are the key challenges in the shipping industry? Uh, big ocean going tankers. Uh, what do we need to do to make this happen? And what are the possible business models? We decided that that was the kind of conversation we want to have. And two or three hours later, this was the degree of input that we had around mm -hmm. that kind of conversation. So these exam questions, uh, these the exam questions were prepared, of course, ahead of time, socialized, these conversations were prepared exactly. And then you build questions uh, that you would then use in these discussions, in these conversations. And people would 
put their ideas on the whiteboard as you were facilitating the discussion. That's how this, that's how we, that's how we could replicate this. That's how we could replicate this. Purely okay. the workshop bit. This is all, everything we've talked about today is 100% germane to the workshop part. It, it pays no heed to the fact that we're all probably slightly more consultative than we've ever been in our lives right now. We're much more communicative through these kinds of devices than we are. So I'm not suggesting this is in isolation of the normal conversational flow or the normal back and fro and that this stuff needs to land in a document or a strategic document or a plan that's then executed through some, you know, system for project management. This is just that workshop bit. But what we've noticed is that there's been a much higher degree of attention as a result of doing it like this than purely having an aimless conversation where, um, you know, someone's just taking notes and then you get back on a call a few weeks later and go through the notes. John, uh, th this intimidates people. I know I was intimidated when you first showed me. Andrew's posting a question about, not a question, he's making a comment about the same, somewhat of the same ilk about this being, this technology maybe being intimidating. intimidating. W what's your reaction to that? Um, I think it can be without a little bit of training. I mean, it was intimidating when I first started on it. Um, okay. I think it falls into the category of how much do we care about getting a good workshop? Got it. Um, and that goes back to also the preparations. Like we can't yeah. just throw up one of these whiteboards, get some clients on a call and pretend like we know what we're doing. It really, it takes a pause and really familiarizing yourself with the technology and then getting together a few people that may want to use it too and say, hey, let's have a, a play date on <laughs> Zoom where we're, interacting and using these things. And then also there's, I know Nicole has posted a few links, but there's YouTube videos for everything now. And yeah. then also these companies, they're just getting started too. So I found that help desks are exceptionally helpful with some of this newer technology. So not being afraid to ask for help when you are looking for it, but really just being super, super prepared before you try and use it in front of an audience. Yeah, I think intimidate, I think that's right. And I think intimidation is a thing. To, to be honest with you though, it took me probably about 20 minutes of hard effort to really look at the controls and start to see how it behaved. Um, and in action, in anger, the one I showed you earlier, probably 30, 40 minutes of frustration and, you know, making it making a few ricks and by the time we got the team onto the call in anger they were pretty expert at it um thanks to you this is uh, decades and decades of incredible insight you've gathered over the over your you know this is your life's work and sharing this with us and some you know the incredible customers you've had from the olympic committee to the vatican to major corporations so this was this was fantastic john thank you for sharing my pleasure uh, with us. absolute pleasure um, yeah. As you said, there'll be, we'll make stuff available to folks online, you know, we'll share that with them. Uh, they have, they'll have a way to get in touch with you and I'll thank our participants for joining. Um, hopefully you found this useful. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Did you like that decades and decades and decades, John? Well, I think it's probably too, too, too many decades stuck. I think I, I think I understand.